Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be back at Harvard. And it is a particular pleasure to address you on Valentine's Day at Radcliffe's, which was the first place where the ladies were admitted to Harvard. Um, I should talk about security from a European perspective. And I should start by saying it is necessary to talk to each other about this issue, since from my perspective at this point in time, we talk too little to each other, but too much about each other. And for that reason, uh, issues such as NSA achieved what they achieved to really produce mistrust, uh, at least on the side of the Europeans. But coming back to security, at the first possibly superficial glance, Europe seems to be at peace. The vision of 1949, when NATO was founded at Washington, D.C., to achieve a Europe whole and free became reality almost 25 years ago when the Berlin Wall fell and the Iron Curtain disappeared. It is what my dear friend, Prince Kohlkraft, said so rightly, Germany united, Europe undivided, and a world transformed. So seen from an American perspective, the mission which began possibly historically in 1917, when the United States entered World War I, seems to be achieved. Obviously, there is from an American perspective no longer any need to come to the rescue of Europe as Americans did it three times in the last century, the last time during the Yugoslav Wars of Succession in uh, the late 90s. Accordingly, Washington shifts its attention to Asia, using first the word pivoting, and then when they learned about the European nervous reaction, uh, embellished it by calling it rebalancing. But is Europe really at peace? Could Europe really preserve peace and maintain its security in its own? Which, after all, is, from my perspective, a strategic interest of the United States. Geostrategy, ladies and gentlemen, still matters. And thus it remains true what the late Admiral, Rear Admiral Alfred Thatcher Mahan wrote in 1890. No maritime power can survive without the control of the two opposing coastlines. The United States of America is a maritime power, as a matter of fact, the only global maritime power. And Europe is on its opposing coastline. So security in Europe is a strategic interest of the United States. We phrased this in 1990, the Paris uh, Accord, when he said the United States are a European power. So from a European perspective now, Europe seems to be at peace. No war is being fought in Europe, and probably there will be no war in Europe as long as Europe remains allied to the United States through NATO, since nobody on Earth can militarily defeat NATO. As NATO offers the United States the control of the European coastline, it is and will remain a strategic interest of the United States to preserve NATO, provided its European members really contribute to it. But security does not mean stability, as long as there is unfinished business in Europe. The biggest chunk of unfinished business at this point in time is the relationship with Russia. Russia is once again becoming an authoritarian regime, which is increasingly insecure about its own role and position in today's globalized world. Russia therefore pursues increasingly assertive politics and was quite successful last year. Europe, on the other hand, needs an arrangement with Russia. Since there is no security in Europe without Russia, and security against Russia will never be achievable. In addition, 
we Europeans are confronted with unfinished businesses in the Balkans, in the Caucasian re region, and there are the unresolved issues of where Ukraine belongs to and where Turkey belongs to Europe or Asia. In, a, in terms of foreign policy, one has to take into account as well that Europe is increasingly looking inward and is trying to heal the wounds inflicted by the Euro crisis, which resulted in a, in a sharp, still unresolved north-south divide in Europe. These issues alone present a full plate, but Europe's once quiet periphery is on fire as well. I was the first to call the region from Morocco, uh, Morocco to the Indian Ocean the arc of crisis in 1991, but I did not foresee that 20 years later the entire region would be in flames and this will probably remain so for a decade or more to come. The so-called Arab Spring toppled a few dictators but did not result in stability, let alone democracy, possibly with the exception of Tunisia. Libya is moving towards a failing state or may split into two separate entities. Egypt is under military rule once again. Syria is the place of a true humanitarian disaster. There, Iran and Saudi Arabia plus Qatar are fighting a proxy war over the dominance of the Persian or Arabian Gulf, to some extent fueled by the Shia and Sunni conflict. And Turkey is trying to prevent the establishment of a Kurdish state. This conflict, which so far claimed more than 100,000 victims, which produced more than 1 million refugees and more than 4 million displaced persons, threatens at the same time to destabilize Lebanon and Jordan and to weaken Turkey economically through the immense refugee burden. The only chance we have at this point in time is to contain the conflict. To intervene, it is simply too late. The chemical warfare episode in summer last year resulted in a rather questionable deal. It strengthened Russia's position in the region and it weakened the credibility of the United States throughout the world, but particularly in Israel and in Saudi Arabia. Al-Qaeda took advantage of the conflict and established a region under its control spanning from Baghdad to the Turkish border north of Aleppo. It is a conflict for which at this point in time no solution is at hand and in which any outside intervention is simply not sustainable. The window for that closed almost two years ago. It is a humanitarian tragedy which condemns the outside world to be helpless observers, a tragedy which threatens to devaluate the principle of the responsibility to protect and which could quickly become a bombshell which might trigger a regional war involving at this point one nuclear power and should the Iran negotiations fail possibly two or should Saudi Arabia in consequence of an Iranian nuclear weapon become a nuclear power as well as three nuclear countries. Whether the Iran negotiations will result in a real tangible deal remains open at this point in time it is questionable. The Syrian conflict is at Europe's doorsteps and it threatens an ally, Turkey. The key to the solution of the conflict rests in Moscow. But whether President Putin is willing to use it or not is absolutely open. Should the conflict further escalate, it could produce tremendous risks for Europe since the Middle Eastern turmoil could jeopardize the safe passage of 43 of the world's gas and oil supply supplies through the states of Hormuz. Europe, as well as Asia, depend on these supplies.
the United States does no longer. The notorious Middle East conflict, the dispute between Israel and Palestine, disappears at the moment behind the smoke screens of the war in Syria, which as a side effect makes a two-state solution rather unlikely any time soon, although the two-state solution would be the best guarantee to the long-term security of Israel. This is the uncomfortable situation of Europe at this very moment. A Thassan in a southeastern periphery on fire, and an eastern periphery behind which an authoritarian Russia is, establish, is attempting to establish a Eurasian Union, that is, a Russian-dominated landmass of authoritarian states ranging from the eastern borders of NATO to the Chinese border, which could easily become a Soviet Union light, big but too weak to threaten NATO. Key to that will be the likely outcome of the Ukrainian crisis, on which we cannot judge at the moment what it will become. We'll see clearer after Sochi will come to an end. The difference to the European situation, which we knew from earlier days, is threefold. First, there is no longer the ultimate and readily available guarantor of European security and indeed of inner European balance, the United States of America. They, as I said early on, believe the job is done. Secondly, there is no longer the seemingly stable ring of countries on the southern shores of the Mediterranean, which protected Europe against waves of uncontrolled migration from Africa in exchange for the blind eye which Europe turned to its dictators. Thirdly, Europe relying on the overwhelming military power of the United States reduced its own capabilities across the entire spectrum of politics during the last decade, thus becoming more dependent on the United States than ever before during the days of the Cold War. Today, to give you a clear example, no European state is capable of dealing on its own with small military issues such as Libya or Mali. The Europeans cannot do it alone. This is the gloomy picture Europe presents today. And it gets even gloomier if one takes into account the diminished influence of the United States in the Middle East, and if one looks briefly at the mid to long-term developments. I will not dwell at length on the mid to long-term risk and uncertainties and on the challenges they may generate for European and indeed Western security. But I would like to indicate at least three new reasons for conflict and the changing nature of military conflicts. In addition to the remaining traditional reasons for armed conflicts, such as territorial disputes or ethnic strife, there are three major new reasons. Demographic imbalances, resource scarcities, and the consequences of climate change. I will give you, for each of them, an example. Population growth in the sub-Saharan Africa may produce as early as 2020, according to the World Bank, the migration of up to 250 million people moving north towards an aging and in some regions depopulated Europe, which will not be able to stop them without the help, at least from the North African countries. In terms of resource scarcity, the most demanded resource of the 21st century will be potable water. Professor Kaiser, who is sitting amongst us, was the first to mention this in Germany in 1990. Nobody believed him then. At this very moment, ladies and gentlemen, more than 700 million people do not have access to what we call drinking water. And approximately 1,000 children die day by day because they drank polluted water. This intolerable situation will get worse since the population on a, on a global scale will grow. And in addition, 
climate change could dramatically accelerate and exacerbate water scarcity. To give you one example from this hemisphere, should the Andean glaciers continue to melt as rapidly as they do at the moment, then a, a huge metropolitan area such as the area of Lima in Peru will no longer dispose of drinking water for the 10 million plus people living there at the moment. But not only the reasons for conflict will change, the nature of warfare will change as well. The monopoly of the state to use force will disappear since non-state actors such as terrorist organizations and criminal cartels will get access to all categories of arms, including weapons of mass destruction. Non-state actors may increasingly become capable of challenging states and of taking control of failing or weak states. In addition, modern technologies such as nanotechnology, bionics and robotics may change the nature of the classical kinetic war, but it could also be that cyber operations may develop beyond the dimension of cyber crime into cyber terrorism and eventually into a full-fledged cyber war. We should never forget it was Sun Tzu who wrote 2,500 years ago that the most elegant way to get control of an enemy is to paralyze him without using force. This will become possible. It could mean that a state could be paralyzed and could thus become simply incapable of controlling the state and that it could be deprived of using any of its instruments of power or of defense, although there are no visible indications that anyone is using force against the state. What does this mean for the task of preserving security and stability in Europe? Europe has to maintain the inden indispensable transatlantic alliance by contributing more than hitherto. And it has to shape in addition to the challenging task of developing a post-Afghanistan role for NATO, three big issues. First, Europe has to contribute to achieving stability in Northern Africa and in the Middle East. Secondly, Europe has to seek ways and means leading towards cooperation and thus lasting stability with Russia. This cannot be achieved without involving the United States, and such a cooperative arrangement has to include a settlement on Ukraine. Third, Europe has to be prepared for a bigger role in the Middle East and for European contributions to American efforts in preventing armed conflicts in the Asian Pacific region. But as I said, Europe is looking inward and it is more or less absorbed by the still unresolved Euro crisis and its rather unfinished and timid attempts of agreeing on a common foreign and security policy. It is a huge agenda, but the Europeans are not worried at all about security issues. Europe erroneously believes that the United States would come and rescue should there be a serious crisis once again. But as I said, the Europeans, uh, the Americans do not wish to do so. And the Europeans on their side do not yet fully understand the changed domestic situation in the United States. It makes, this domestic situation makes it rather unlikely that a nation deeply wounded at 9-11 and internally divided, tired of wars, and of entangling commitments, will act in any situation which is not seen by a majority of American citizens as a clear and present danger for the United States and as a threat to vital American national interests. I cannot imagine any European crisis which would meet this requirement. Europe does also not yet fully understand the dimension of the most important strategic game changer which happened during this decade, 
called the shale gas revolution. The shale gas revolution will usher in a period of unparalleled strategic advantages for the United States. The United States will approximately by 2020 to 2025 be the only country in the world which will most probably enjoy geostrategic invulnerability, more or less autonomy as far as natural resources are concerned, and military superiority, since it will be the one and only country in the world which can deploy and use globally military forces in all five dimensions of modern war, land, air, sea, space, and cyber. But the American nation is deeply divided. It looks inward, and at the moment, to put it as diplomatically as possible, its president does not show too much interest in foreign policy. Furthermore, the very substantial national debts of the United States reduce strategic flexibility and offer lender nations such as China a powerful instrument of influence. Therefore, Europe, say the European Union, has to review and to widen its European strat security strategy, and it has to do more in, uh, in terms of security and defense. Europe has to develop a EU strategy for Africa and the EU strategy for Asia, and it should outline Europe's outlook on the future of the indispensable transatlantic alliance and the EU objectives of in developing a strategic partnership with Russia. The latter is the element which Europe will never be capable of implementing without the United States. It therefore has to be coordinated with the United States and it should be negotiated together with the United States since its most important security element is to deal with the nuclear dimension. The aim should be to uh, negotiate a comprehensive security arrangement which will first and foremost eliminate the flawed idea which at present is in the forefront of Russian thinking. The idea of compensating conventional inferiority by substrategic nuclear weapons. In return for an arms control agreement on substrategic nuclear forces, NATO could and possibly should offer a cooperative formula on missile defense. Thus, NATO could signal to Russia that Russia's western border is safe. And thus, the West would tell the Russians that, is under, that it is understood by the Europeans that there is no lasting security in Europe without security for Russia. But the element for which time is really of the essence is Northern Africa. The EU has to identify a comprehensive set of actions aiming at the stabilization of the countries from Djibouti to Nigeria. Such a strategy should focus on steps which could encourage the Africans to stay in their countries, such as economic and technical assistance, but it should also include assistance in achieving good governance and the rule of law, as well as security sector reform. Undoubtedly, it has to include military instruments, as well as the tool of last resort, on the one hand, and as instrument of providing both the, security, the secure environment in which economic and development aid can unfold, and in which the implementation of security sector reform can be done. And finally, the EU has to develop a strategy for Asia. This, this again should be done in close coordination and in cooperation with the United States for two reasons. First, the EU is the world's strongest economic power, and as such it has its own interest in Asia. And secondly, if coordinated with the United States, the EU would convey the message that the Europeans stand shoulder to shoulder with their American allies as the Americans embark on a cooperative security arrangement with China. It will not be easy to coordinate the views of all 28 EU members and to agree on these three elements of a future EU security strategy. 
which should include ideas for the res resolution of the smaller unresolved issues which I mentioned, such as the Balkans and the Caucasian region. But it will be a hell of a task to get the European countries to contribute to the implementation of any of such strategy steps. The implementation of such a strategy has to include some military improvements as well, since the present situation must not continue. The EU countries spend approximately a little more than 50% of what the Americans spend on defense, but they produce as little as 15% of the, Amer of the American power projection capabilities. Obviously, the instrument of improvement is not the call for a certain percentage of the GMP to be spent on defense. These attempts failed in the past, and they will fail again, since there is no control and there is no sanction regime. The road to improvement is what is called pooling and sharing of assets, including the option of designating framework nations for certain military tasks. The tool is also not the call for a European army. This is simply a non-starter at this moment. Provided the EU nations were willing to engage in such steps, the result would be a set of multinational force components which should help overcoming today's deficiencies in the areas of command, control, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, of sea and air transport, including air refueling, and in particular of special operation forces. Such steps, properly coordinated with NATO, could at the same time enhance NATO's capability and they could open the door to more transatlantic cooperation. They may require some upfront investment, but these steps promise for the midterm achieving better capabilities without necessarily spending more money for defense. But key to the success of such an approach is the political will to share risks and burdens with Europe's North American allies and to enhance the military capabilities in order to become the indispensable partner of the North American democracies. So we could possibly achieve what we were dreaming of in Paris in 1990, a zone of common security ranging from Vancouver to Vladivostok. The crucial prerequisite for such a strategy is that partners need to know that they can rely on all members of the organization concerned. Otherwise, pooling and sharing will never materialize. Recent statements by leading politicians of, the, of Germany, which so long boasted a culture of reticence and thus acquired the reputation of being an unreliable ally, suggest that the tide is turning, thus opening the door for more European and more transatlantic cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe Europe is, at this point in time, at the crossroads in terms of security. As it can no longer depend on the American Fire Brigade if there are fires on its periphery, Europe should insist that the common defense of the common sphere will remain the responsibility of NATO, but that Europe will undertake all necessary steps, making sure that the European periphery can be stabilized. Thus, Europe could, and indeed should, become an actor in all domains of politics, acting where and when necessary at a global scale in close cooperation with the United States. Taking this line, the, U the European Union could supplement the TTIP negotiations in terms of security. This could eventually become the divisive step towards achieving what I earlier called the common zone of security from Vancouver to Vladivostok. The two nations which determine the future of the indispensable transatlantic relationship must overcome the present difficulties and such they could once again stand united. Drifting apart must never be tolerated, since then both would lose in tomorrow's world. The Europeans first, 
Pan-American Allies II. Thank you very much.